Kevin Can, uh, primarily a writer, more uh, background. In. <laughs> right, so we're at Cap Oliver Fern, at the Clifftop Cafe. Folkestone's over there. Dover's behind us. France is there, and uh, and the sun's out. Where were we? We were talking about Sergeant Pepper. We were talking about Aladdin Sane and how impactful they were on me. And uh, graphic art has been a massive part of my life, or always will be. And um, those guys were great artists. But he was a great art. You know, this guy was a is a huge artist. Why doesn't anybody else see it? this? Isn't just pop music. This is art. You know, I really felt that I was quite alone back then. And it was only when, you know, started to meet like-minded people at places like Wembley, for Bowie's, that suddenly thousands of other people were there that were equally enchanted by this guy. You know, you hardly met them before. I was only two or three people at my school, my secondary school, that even mentioned David Bowie. You know, it was, um, even though he was a big name, he was still a cult in many ways, you know. You know, he wasn't a Donny Osmond or a David Cassidy or, you know, we're... A lot of people were kind of, you know, the younger people were gravitated to. He was, a, you know, he was out on his own still, David, and uh, and I liked that as well. You know, I thought well, if you don't get it, I get it. You know, so you, you, if you by following David, particularly through a lot of the seventies, really, you were part of a, a club, a, you know, a very elite club of people, like-minded people that understood what was going on, and it, it you know, it literally. Although people, it did build up over the years, and, and obviously they became a lot more famous and uh, a lot more successful record sales-wise as time went by. It really took his death for people to suddenly go, "Hang on a minute, wasn't he brilliant?" You know, and suddenly the whole world woke up to him, and it's like, "Where have you been?" <laughs> you know, "Where have you been?" I've, I've been kind of following this for a long time, and uh, but it was kind of also, you know, I mean, David would, would have been amazed at that. The response he, you know, that had happened after he died, he would have been absolutely flawed. You know, I think towards the end of his life, he was concerned really that, you know, had he done what he needed to do, he wasn't even sure he'd done enough. And this is a guy that ordinarily, uh, there's about eight or nine, ten different careers, big careers in this one man's life. You know, huge careers. You know. Some of David's less successful singles would have made someone's whole career. One of, one of them, you know. The, 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 that's the scale of work that this man put out over, over time. Special. We brought you here as well because you've brought some special things with you. And uh, You only want, want me for my memorabilia, Jason. Let's be, that, be honest about it. That's the kind of guy I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I brought a few things. I mean, first thing I brought along will... Um, startle many people it, it won't really because it's not that rare but it it is in many ways because this is my own copy and, and nobody else's this is the copy that i bought in 1973 this is the my copy of aladdin sane and i used to keep it wedged up on the side in my various places of uh, where i lived and, uh, for many years so it's kind of faded over years but uh, this to me was astonishing. This this image, this stuffy image, and it was fantastic being able to work with um, Brian's family. Really, um, I got to know Brian a little bit before he died, just a little bit. But um, it was really after his he died that I did most of the work with the Duffy estate, Chris, and um, and that seemed to really to me to be a kind of a full circle thing. Really, um, it was like me being able to thank the photographer, the, uh, one of the, 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 uh, the ideas men behind this. I mean, how do you get, 1973, later how do you get that? In, you know, where does that come from? And that's what intrigued me. Where does that come from? How do you get to that image? You know, everybody else is just standing in front of a camera smiling, you know. I mean, even the Beatles, to a degree, they put army uniforms on, but that's really all they did. So, you know, that's, in, that's quite an, an amazing thing. And, and of course, everybody's doing it now. You know, it's, you know, you put more paint on your face, you're going to probably sell more records. That's my copy of Aladdin Sane. Now, the other thing I, I wanted to point out about that is that um, in 1999, I was asked by EMI 
to repackage the David's albums, or, um, about 17 albums. Uh, he had uh, moved on from Ryko and uh, uh, EMI had, had done a massive licensing deal. And it was, you know, a big thing. And um, it's a very long and tortuous story. I did explain a bit of it to you a bit earlier, Jason. I don't think we'll go in, into the whole detail now. But basically, in short, we, uh, myself and Nigel Reeve, who was coordinating the sound side, I was more on the visual side. We started on the project a couple of months in, it was taken away from us. And it all went over to the States. It was basically another part of EMI that got involved. I won't sort of go into too much more detail, but David had lunch with somebody and they said, oh, we would love to work on it. And he gave it to them. A few months later, I mean, you know, it was dis we were all distraught. Everybody on the London office and myself had this whole project taken away from us. A few months later, the phone goes, EMI, what are you doing? The project's come back. Can you get up to SI? Shot over, shot over there in the car, met up with Nigel, and basically, long and short of it is, the American team that had worked on it hadn't hit the mark for David at all. And his words to his good people in New York were, I don't like this, give it back to Kevin Can. And that's what EMI told me when we got there. So we got it back. And the problem was we had, if we had eight weeks, I'll, I'll be surprised. It was probably more like six or seven weeks to turn around 17 albums. And we couldn't base it on the original work we did. We'd obviously started on repairing some of the earlier covers. Um, and there was an immense amount of work to do. No, all the original films had been lost. It was basically a start again job. And uh, so the long and short of it is one of the, again, uh, leading back to the cover I brought with me, is we didn't have certain covers. We didn't have certain films for certain covers. And previous, even RCA, I think, had lost. If you look at the RCA, re re their issues of early C CDs of David's and then Ryko's, the, the covers are pretty poor quality wise. And that's something I really wanted to change. But it meant I needed a cover, and this became the de facto official Aladdin Sane cover around the world for many years. My cover that I bought was the cover that we used, uh, we photographed a very high um, resolution, and a lot of work went into making it look as close as we could to the original. And so, over a period of a few weeks, we turned around the, that catalogue, put out 17 albums. Anybody that works in the industry knows how difficult that is for various technical reasons, uh, which I won't go into. But suffice to say that CDs are, aren't just produced, on this scale, aren't just produced in the UK. So you know, you'll have pressing plants in America doing their own lot, our, uh, here, certain places in Europe doing more. Um, Far East doing something. So you have to create masters that go around the world, which means you have to sign off artwork very early. The long and short of it is, by the time I was halfway through, I'd like to have done it slightly differently. I, I had different ideas coming together. Right, I now know what I'm doing, you know, but it was set in stone by then. And we, as it is, I'm still happy with it. I put all the um, the little images of David on the, on the spine which I thought was quite nice. And that became a kind of motif for a lot of the promotions we did thereafter. And, um, and I, you know, I'm still happy with that. Those are still my de facto albums in my record uh, shelf. I know immediately where Scary Monsters is or Low, or, you know, they're all there. There you go. The David Bowie, the David Bowie series. So that was um, quite an amazing project. And I have to say at the end of it, we all thought we did well and David really liked it. New York were very happy. Everybody was happy apart from Record Collector magazine. Different story. Right so yes to, to sort of round this little project up um, I put together three limited edition books um, which were based on uh, all the covers and I did one for EMI, one for me and one for David and David Bowie, 1969 
1989, which was where this particular series finished, of course. It came out in 1999, but that's where this particular story ended. And there's a little, uh, just a little sort of, when did I deliver that? So that was 2nd of the 12th, 99, book two of three. David had number one of three, and EMI had number three of three, Nigel. And these are all the albums. So all the albums we, we put in here. And when David got his copy, he was bowled over. So much so that um, years later, people would say, oh, you know, I was, I was with David the other day. Guess what he showed me? He showed me this wonderful little book. He's so proud of it. I said, don't tell me it's all the album covers. Yeah, that's it. It's beautiful. You know, I said, yes, yeah, I did that for him. You know, so it really hit the mark. He really appreciated that. And, um, and what people didn't, you know, when people were having, well, one magazine decided to have a bit of a go, what they didn't realise is they were also having a go at David Bowie because David had signed off everything that we did and loved it, absolutely backed it. So he was mortified, as mortified as anybody when this review came through. And, you know, it, it stung all of us at the time and it was very unfair, very unfair. And, you know, but you know these things happen. You do things in public. You put your you put your head above the parapet, and you are going to get people sniping at you. But normally they're created for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. I've got another little book here. This oh, this is called Point It Out. Um, that's two things in here actually forgot about that so uh, this is just a little school book called point it out and it's david's school book i've got a, i've got two i've got three at home and this is uh from his second year david jones 2d and all the books that all, all his study books were this size they were you know so that must have been the sort of de facto i have to ask george underwood this must be the de, the de facto kind of size unless it was something that david preferred and his family bought him a load of. This is actually quite good. This is full of graphic images. There's probably some ideas here that he used on Conrad's and things like that. I'll have to study it a bit more. So that's quite nice. Uh, I've got one where he's got school results written in the back. But I forgot this was in here. I haven't seen this for a while. This was tucked in this particular book. And he had obviously at some point just typed out a list of all the songs he'd written to date at one point. So this is David's type list and he's scribbled some out and he's ticked others. I don't, you know, what the tickings were about, I don't know. There's one, Say Goodbye to Mr Mind, that he's ticked. Uh, Lincoln House, the next one he hasn't ticked. Over the Wall he hasn't ticked. Over the Wall we go. Um, Love It Till Tuesday, he has ticked. So there's no reason, you know, because uh, Say Goodbye to Mr Mind was never released at the time. Good track. Um, and we've got, so yeah, so here's our, 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 some, some unknown Bowie material on there. And the amazing thing is, in the last few years, the amount of uh, unknown songs that are appearing is incredible. Things that I'd never heard of, plus there's things that have turned up in David's um, archive, which, uh, you know, since David died, that have uh, been uh, surfacing, that they've been finding which are quite fascinating as well. So yeah, there we go. Um, anything else on here? So we've got, th these are all the kind of 67, things up to 67, including kind of thinking about me and uh, London boys, Pancho, Silver Sunday. Don't think I've heard that one. See, there's tracks that we know of. We just don't know where they are. Leaving at six. Oh, I know what that is. So there's, yeah, there's all kinds of interesting things on there. And when did you get this? I just found it at a boot sale, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, it was left at Ken's for that. Oh, Ken, you're right. Ken Pitt. Ken Pitt, yeah. David left a lot, of, luckily for us, David left a lot of interesting things behind when he left Ken's place for the last time in 69. He moved back in for a while after he broke up with Hermione. And uh, there was still a lot of things he'd left in the flat anyway, and he brought a lot of other things over. But he left a load of stuff behind, quite a lot of uh, demo tapes as well, and drawers full of bits and pieces. Um, so that's one of the things. Uh, another thing I, I haven't shown, I don't think anybody's seen this, but again, this was in Ken's archive and a um, bit of a fa fascinating relic. This is 
sort of an army surplus belt. But this is the belt he wore in Space Oddity, in Love It All Tuesday. So if, if you look, watch Space Oddity again closely, you'll see this belt hanging about there on David. And pocket doesn't open, it's just a false, you know, it's just for a display purposes, army belt of some kind, you know. But uh, yeah, there we are, that's the, uh, that is the belt. And I've had a few other bits and pieces from the filming as well. But, um, you know, Ken luckily understood the value of a lot of these things and uh, kept a lot of things. One thing he didn't keep, which would have been nice, is one of the t-shirts with Major Tom on it. Um, I don't know why, um, probably the production team had those, but I've never seen those surface anywhere. Here's a photograph session that a lot of us will know about. Um, it's been used a lot, famous. It was for Fabulous 208 magazine. And um, great session. And that was Ken Pitt's shirt. And for ages I used to say to Ken, have you, well, not for ages, he mentioned to me once he had it. And then one day I was around his place and I said, have you got that Paisley shirt still? You know, and he said, well, I do... I do the roses in it, you know, that, you know, when I'm in the garden, that's my gardening shirt. And I went, oh, it's a bit of a waste, Ken, isn't it? Anyway, a couple of weeks later, it arrived in the post. He sent it to me. And uh, I, I, I've got better pictures of it. I took, the, you know, I got it framed up years ago, and there, there's a sort of a, that's the shirt. I didn't want to bring it with me today. Bit heavy. It really is quite a heavy beast. Big big piece of but you've got a paisley shirt on in homage yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah there, you go. there we go there's a paisley. <laughs> um so there and a letter from ken with it saying you know it's a bit fake it says the letter says something like you know kev i hope you you like the uh, shirt um I, I discovered it's a bit faded now because i used to do a bit faded and worn because i do the used to do the roses in it or something like that and when david first came round to my apartment my apartment my flat in watford this used to be above the fireplace um, in my main lounge and he walked straight up to it and he was like you know really intrigued as I hoped he would be and he sort of looked at it and read Ken's letter and he got to the bit where he said faded threadbare you know and I could even go faded threadbare like a really like uh, he was alerted to like he was concerned you know and I, it was just really made me smile you know and uh, so David, you know, saw this again in the early 1990s and was quite impressed with it. He came face to face with the shirt that he often used to borrow and wander around with. He wore it in Malta as well when they were out in Malta, as Ern Ken did. Um, they were at the song festival. It got used a lot and, um, and in a few other photo sessions. So um, that's, that's my most tre treasured item, if you like. That and a painting that David did for me. He did me a wonderful painting, um, which was still wet. He was going to bring it around. He said, right, I've, I've done a painting, I'm going to bring it over. He was so excited about it. And then for some reason that week he ran out of time. And um, I think I've got another spider wandering around me. Um, for some reason he couldn't make it over. And uh, so he left it at a mutual friend's place in town. And I, a couple of days later, went and picked it up. And the guy said, oh, be careful. David says it might still be wet. And it, it was. I mean, it, it ladled it with so much paint, so much, uh, probably acrylic. It was, it was still wet. And, you know, talk about fresh and uh, fabulous. So he's staying at various hotels in town. He's living, living at these hotels primarily, but working out of the house in Fulham. And we would meet there daily a lot of the time uh, and go through the, the latest things that needed to be done and there was a huge amount that had to be done I, I worked on everything with him on that exhibition I set up the wallpaper deal with Laura Ashley I did all of that it was my idea to to even involve Laura Ashley it wasn't David's and it, you know he got a little bit of stick for that later on you know David Bowie and Laura Ashley we just thought it was funny but also saying that Thank God for Laura Ashley as well. You know, they they were brilliant. They immediately understood the the, the strange relationship that was there, and embraced it. And 
you know, talking to Crown and Dulux and all these people, it went right over their head. You know, David Bowie, you know, they, they, nobody could quite understand that we were trying to do some wallpaper designs, you know. As it was, I mean, even the designs that David came up with were basically obscene, you know. And Laura actually had no problem. David brought literally everything he worked on over to the gallery, which was amazing. The gallery, in the week leading up to the show, we had it for about four or five days before the show opened because we, we basically redecorated the whole place and re, <laughs> re, redesigned the pillars even. We put the wallpaper and these pillars around the posts that were there. Everything was very bespoke and a uh, big sound system laid in all around the gallery which I had to set up and, and they had to link into various devices that David had brought with him that had to be, you know, I had to sort of... Uh, get soldered in and all this kind of stuff you know it was kind of quite a lot you know particularly last minute things it was quite fraught and and David got pretty tetchy the day before because he was pretty scared about the whole thing opening hadn't really factored in quite how scared he was to be honest with you so you know looking back on it now it was a big moment for him you know he was used to the music industry but the art industry was a whole beast and he'd never done that before been so public with his work so I appreciate now what he was going through, really, in retrospect. But we, you know, we came up with something amazing, you know, and I, I was really pleased with that. And seeing all the artwork, all of his artwork, tons of it we couldn't fit in. I mean, all the Berlin period artwork, and it, it, it was all laying around, propped up on, you know, three or four, five canvases deep, you know. And it was like, right, we've got to choose. What, what, what do you think, Kevin? What should we put? And it's like, again, he would ask my opinion on things from time to time. And it used to floor me. One day he said to me, I'm going out on the road, you know, in six months. What colours, what colour lighting shall I use? You know, me? You know, you're asking me? You know, it used to be fantastic. Glenn Miller's out there somewhere. In the water. In the water. Bless him. There's a link with Bowie, actually, Glenn Miller. What a lot of people may not know, doing my Michael Caine, is that um, the Conrads used to open, David's saxophone was one of the first things that, people would hear at Conrad because they used to open with uh, In The Mood. Oh, right. That was their opening number. <laughs> How's it go? <laughs> so there's yeah. Mr. Jones on his sax <laughs> and then the Conrad's bang. So whenever you hear that now, think about David and the Conrad's. Wow. So there's a little bit of trivia for you. And we're facing Folkestone. We can see folks behind you, Jason, is Folkestone. And Lee's Cliff Hall is just there, and Lee's Cliff Hall, David. That's David's link with Folkestone, apart from occasionally taking the ferry from around about this area and um, whatever, and hovercrafts and things. Um, he did the Radio One Club there in '69. Beyond there is uh, Little Stone, and Little Stone, we've worked out in the last year, is where David did his first lower third gig. Um, we've actually been able to piece it together now because of various things that we found. I was, wasn't was sure, I think I put the date in any day now, but I wasn't sure, 100% sure, but we're now sure he did play at that gig. And that's uh, not too far from where I live now. And, uh, and funny enough, Phil Lancaster used to live near me for a while as well, he came down. We often used to go for lunch nearby and stuff, and it was only afterwards I said, oh, by the way, Phil, this is where, you know, this is where David did his first life. I mean, the, the chances of all that, those things happening, are, you get these very strange things happen sometimes that, you know, overlap, you know, all the places and things and that these things can happen. And uh, so, yeah, I used to pass that quite often with Phil and not know it, you know. The, the hotel isn't there anymore, the one they used to play at, but the, uh, the, the footprint is, you know, you know exactly where it is. Never once asked him for an autograph ever never asked him for an autograph um i wish i had now the times he'd came you know at times he came, he came around to my flat a couple of times and uh, and to my studio a couple of times as well and n now i just wish i it just said oh david see those albums there you don't mind just signing those for me you know but I'd, i just didn't want to impose on him you know and the thing is the other thing about it is i um always let him take the lead so if we're working and suddenly he started to reminisce, he might sort of say to me, do you know where um, Freddie is? Or have you heard about Freddie recently? Or how's Hermione or something like that, you know? 
and then you knew uh, suddenly there was an opening and before you knew it you were just reminiscing and he was reminiscing and the door and you could talk about anything pretty much you know the, you, and I mean now I think god I wish I'd asked him this this and you know a million and one more things but again I didn't want to go get too pushy you know and there were times I thought wow you know you, you're just getting information that you know it's just people have got so wrong over the years you know and and, and also I got to really know how human he was. That was a real surprise to me, how vulnerable he was as well. You know, people wouldn't know, you know, if he got, things that things would upset him, easily upset him, you know, and he was also very strong as well, strong enough to be able to deal with a lot of that stuff and a lot of rubbish. You, you have to be very tough to be able to deal with the industry as a whole, particularly on that level. You know, where you can get a lot of rubbish thrown at you unfairly, as well as a massive amount of love as well. You know, you know, I always remember hearing about the Beatles at the height of their popularity. Somebody in their office saying, "You know, we get two lots of posts for the Beatles, and we could literally split it down the middle. That side is the love mail, and that side's the hate. You know, and you could split it right down the middle, and that." I always thought it was incredible, you know, why would you want to spend your time sending people something about what you didn't like about them, I thought that was awful, really, but that's what you get when you, you know, you, you get to that kind of level. I don't think David ever got that much, and I don't know why the Beatles did, to be honest with you, but, um, don't, you know, people, a lot of people didn't like David back in the day, you know, I, I, you know, you, you, you'd be at parties and things, you'd be lucky if people would play a Bowie track, you know, it was all sort of disco and and disco, <laughs> you know, there wasn't much in between, you know, you put something on, oh let's put Boys Keep Swinging on or, you know, I mean maybe Golden Years, you might be able to get away with Golden Years or something from Young Americans, but, you know, it was hard, it was hard you know, to, 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 to share the love of David back then with, until you got to a concert and then you, you suddenly you met thousands of people that were amazing like yourself you know you thought wow wow look at these people you know and you instantly made i remember i was queuing up for the first night of wembley 70 76 and i got there very early before anybody else i, I just wanted to soak it all up it was so, such a big event for me and all these people were gradually arriving from all over the country and instantly were your best friend and i'm sort of thinking do I know this person? You know, he's like best mates for me now. You know, do I? I'm sure I've not been in touch with him before. You know, it, you know, and they're they from Manchester or Liverpool or Glasgow. Or, you know, wonderful camaraderie as this evening built up of people just celebrating Bowie. You know, his homecoming, which it, it seemed like an eternity had been away. You know, and that, th those gigs at Wembley were astonishing. Never seen anything like it before or since. You know, it was just mind blowing, fantastic. I wish they'd been filmed professionally. You know, it's uh, that would have been something. Yeah, were they filmed at all? I think uh, there's bits and pieces. You yeah. know, French TV. You get the odd thing, and then Clips. and you know, there's the odd you know fan. You know, even the eight millimeter stuff is interesting. You know, just to just to get an idea. In fact, I saw something not so long ago, which I'd never seen before, maybe a month or two back, probably YouTube or something. And it was filmed on the last night, and it seemed to be almost where I was sitting, but quite close to the stage, across from the stage, slightly up. And I thought, I don't know, and somebody right close to me, behind me, you know, was filming on an 8mm camera. And I thought, bloody hell, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> Couldn't have afforded one back then, anyway. But I mean, you know, yeah. So um, yeah. So there's there scraps of footage, but nothing. Um, we, we, a whole concert would have been fantastic, proper, you know, because that, you know, we, we, David saw that lighting in Cabaret in '68, and he tried. He used it a bit for um, the latter Ziggy shows. A lot of white light. He, you know, he understood the power of it, and it really was powerful. I mean, by the time he was on that that uh, European 
particularly when he got to Europe, it, the, the whole tour kind of started to morph a bit more. He'd, he was really, um, he'd really brought into Isherwood big time. And even though the plan was to move to Switzerland, Isherwood was already working his magic on him and, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be in Berlin, you know, and uh, you get this, this whole white light event was so much a part of how David was feeling at the time, an expression of expressionism <laughs> you know it was david sort of you know going this is me now this is how i feel you know and and you know and i'm i'm not quite right yet you know he, he was you know we were watching we were still watching the fallout of david as thomas jerome newton you know he still had the same kind of hair coloring from the film you know um he was still carrying that character and and, and sort of starting to find his feet again as david bowie you know um and of course, that was the last great character as well, Thin White Duke, after that. I mean, Brian Eno said to him, you know, a while after, you know, when they were working together, listen, David, you don't have to live the characters. You know, you could see he was tortured by these things he was carrying around with him, these people. He was, you, know, you don't have to live them, you know, you could just act them. And then after that, it was very wise words from Brian, but sadly, it kind of moved David away a little bit from that kind of rock star that was living it. You know, he suddenly sort of grew up a little bit and, you know, and became a bit more adult about it. And I liked it when he was still living it, you know. The 78 tour was great. I mean, I enjoyed that. And I, that's when I first met him briefly backstage at Earl's Court. But, um, you know, the Thin White Duke was, was mean and moody, you know, and. Ah, there was real drama going on there. Yeah. Oh, right. some more photos, very briefly, okay. some more photos. So, um, Flowers East were setting up. Um, at that point, we were doing. There was some filming going on, and David was going, "Kevin, is that straight?" And I'm going, eh, "It's all right." I'd laid these out for him. He was, he'd come up with a design which wasn't that successful, and I saw it. He'd written, it, he'd sketched it on the side of a box, and they hadn't started putting them up. And I said, "Oh, do you mind if I have a go at that, David?" And I did another rough layout. And he went, "Oh yeah, that's what I want." So after that, I put his pictures up at galleries. He liked, it. he liked what I did. And there's another one. That's when there's some filming going on. Brian's come over to have a look to see what we're, what's going on. David's having a crafty fag. David being filmed by either NBC or CBS. I think it's NBC. I've never seen this footage. If anybody's ever seen this or has it, please let us know. Please let the cheap things know. And he's got there his portfolio. In there was all the that, that you know there was a limited edition portfolio uh, that he brought over that it was especially for this show. I think. Anyway, he had about twenty made. It's another one with a portfolio. Exclusives here. I'm not showing any of these. K Kate starting to put the pictures up. Kate was David's art advisor. You know the world is now fascinated by David more than it ever has been before and and there's still things to discover there you know there are still things that will happen and st will come out that I think will still surprise people and that's great I mean who you know which artist or any band or any you know, who, who can still do that you know Bowie's amazing he really is I mean he's always got surprises I've still f I find out things new things all the time I'm he never ceases to amaze me. He was very clever as well. He he used to be very careful about information he would let out and very clever about not correcting things as well. If things were, weren't quite right, he didn't mind. Let it go, you know. It just adds to the confusion, adds to the, you know, the the, the layers of mystery. And, um, and that was, any day now was really trying to unravel some of that mystery and... Uh, and I'm pleased to say it came out one day he was still alive and he liked it. And that was good enough for me. You know, he, he, he appreciated what I did. And, you know, it was good. It was good. It was, it was, it was a pleasure. To, so I was so lucky to work with him. And the Apollo thing this year, wasn't that amazing? You know, and all that was well linking back into to David somehow, you know. Yeah, you know, of course, the, the space oddities. The space oddities. Years. You know, it, it, for a lot of people, it, it, 
it, it was because of David Bowie's involvement with that song that it meant a lot to them. You know, there was even a documentary, a, a BBC uh, Radio 2 documentary just about Space Oddity and, it's, and, 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 and the momentous uh, thing it was at the time. So that's intertwined with that history now. Um, and what an incredible moment in history it was, you know. It's just astonishing, you know, that not just David's song, but, you know, the actual event itself. What an incredible thing. What we achieved as uh, a race of people, you know, astonishing. I guess David Bowie's the only guy to have two songs physically sort of played in space, because there was the cover of Space on the, T on the International uh, Space with Station. David, with Hadfield, wasn't it? And there? also when Elon Musk shot a, a shot car. Shot Tesla. Was yeah. it? No, it wasn't a Tesla, was it? It, it, it was, was like one, a. It was one of his like cars, a, like a Mustang or something. No, it was one of his was sports it? cars, uh, um, but on the stereo of the car radio. I think it, it was just, Starman. It plays on a loop. Plays on a loop. So um, it's incredible. I mean, who would have thought? I mean, you know. I think back to you know David. You know, in the flat. They were they were, um, well, the house they were renting in Clareville Grove, where he wrote Space Oddity. Um, people say it was a bed sit. It was actually a house that they were sharing with other people, and um, the thought of what he was going to create with that, and and the way he was going to change the world in his own way, you know, from that third floor bedroom, you know, the, what sort of came from that moment, really, um, which in part was engineered by Ken Pitt. Ken, you know, created this film, which David was interested in and wasn't interested in because he was trying to, he was starting to move away and his ideas were changing. But Ken said, David, we need something special for this film. And that's all David needed to hear. I need something special, you know. RCA said it to him a bit later on. David, we need something special. He knew it when he was writing Hunky Dory. I need something special. And he came up with Life on Mars. Ziggy, it was Starman. These are all end pro you know end of project items i need something special space oddity was written as the film was going as a production we need something special and he did you know the, he, he had the ability just to raise the bar and and do something astonishing and um create a bit of history i could have brought the demo along with me today but it's so precious yeah we've got a space david space oddity demo amazing which, uh, which a lot of people love and uh, and want. <laughs> Danny Baker loved it when I showed it to Danny. Yeah. He, he said, this is the, it was like shaking, this is the most important record I've ever held. It's a real piece of history. Yeah. Amazing. So yeah, so there we go. A little bit of, um, bit of Bowie memorabilia, nostalgia, conversation, just as the van starts up in the background. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's Thank been you. wonderful. Thanks, Jason. And, and uh, really uh, educational too. Thanks to all the cheap things, uh, aficionados out there. Keep up the uh, good su support. Thank uh, you. you know, and, uh, it's a great club. Yeah.